All right, let's get started. This is the agenda that we'll be covering throughout the webinar today. We're starting off with an optimization basics recap of what we've covered in the last optimization webinar session. And then we'll go into best practices and A-B testing. And we'll also touch on user flow designs and CPM targets. And then finally, we'll close with a Q&A session. So I'd like to spend some time today providing a little bit of insight into the underlying foundation of publisher monetization. Before we dive into our latest optimization tips, I'd like to underscore several um, fundamental components that all publishers should consider when monetizing their app with audience network. This is the formula that I covered in the optimization basic session. To increase revenue, there are two pillars to optimize. The first is impression and the second is CPM. I'm going to talk about CPM optimization first. So when you look at CPM optimization, always pick the right formats that fit the user journey in your application. You must try to acquire and retain quality users on your app and focus on creating a user experience that drives meaningful conversions. We also touched on implementing CPM targets, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail. When it comes to impression optimization, there are all, quite a few factors that contribute to impression. Um, let's look at it like a funnel. Think about it like this eight layer funnel. So the first is the number of apps that are integrated within audience network. This is an easy one. The more apps that you have integrated with audience network, the more revenues that you'll have with audience network. And if you're facing difficulties on the integration process, please do reach out to us. The help center in your monetization manager dashboard is there for that very reason. Uh, the second is the number of platforms. So developers who publish applications on both Play Store um, and iTunes App Store have a greater potential to reach more audience. The third is the install base. The number of people who installed your app or your game involves user acquisition strategies to drive more app installs. So during the stage, many publishers decide to reinvest part of that monetization revenue on Facebook ads to target the right type of users of their application. And then you, all, you wanna also look at user engagement. So this is about creating the meaningful experience on your app um, to ensure that user retention. And once you have an insured user base, you wanna look at the amount of traffic that you're sending to audience network. So the higher your traffic, the better the opportunity is with audience network. Audience network works best when we are at the top of the waterfall. And we do understand that publishers usually work with multiple networks and split total impressions between these networks. So in order for audience network to work best, we recommend that you put us at the top of your waterfall, especially if you're um, in the beginning of, uh, in the beginning stages of your app so the audience network can begin to calibrate your app accurately. And so this allows audience network to see all the available impressions and it gives you the best understanding of where you stand with audience network holistically. After a couple of weeks, you can recalibrate your waterfall based on performance and how audience network performs with respects to um, other ad networks. And then you'll also want to look at the match rate and fill rate. So this involves your user acquisition strategy. You wanna ensure that you acquire users with Facebook profiles on their devices in order for audience network to fill these ad requests. And uh, lastly, we look at show rate. This refers to the number of ad requests that were filled by audience network and shown to the user. And it involves your user experience and your user interface design to really ensure that your users can easily see these ads. So placement quality is really important here. A low show rate will over time impact your fill component. And payout also depends on how many ads were shown to that user and not just how many requests were filled by audience network. So this metric is one that publishers really need to keep an eye on. 
And ultimately, when you put all of this together, these factors will impact your revenue with Audience Network. So let's move along into optimization best practices. While there is commonality between what you as a publisher want and what advertisers want, it's not always easy to align those interests. So of course, this is not a one size fits all solution that gives every publisher the perfect solution. But based on what we've learned over the past several years, I'll walk through some specific steps that your team can take and test and iterate to find what works best for you and your audience. We're constantly developing new ways to drive better outcome for advertisers and more revenue for publishers. So these initiatives help our system just do just that. Um, we strongly believe that by improving the user experience within your app, you can optimize your monetization stream with Audience Network and have a more sustainable business overall. So to begin exploring how to optimize your revenue, we'll need to build a solid foundation, which includes implementing the SDK properly, looking into ad spaces, ad caching, and ad experience. These are the four basic pillars to begin your monetization journey. So let's talk about each one of these. Um, starting with the SDK, you want to ensure that you implement and install the SDK correctly and continue to update to the latest SDK. Beta releases commonly come with great incentives for publishers, including Facebook ad credits to help you close the loop on your user acquisition strategy. So make sure to keep your eye out for that. Um, for ad spaces, you want to understand the user flow in your app to determine available ad spaces and ad formats to ensure good player experience. Then there's ad caching. Ensure that your publisher is not requesting ads long before they are ready to serve the ad to the user. So this will impact your fill rate over time. Currently, the max ad caching time allowed is about 60 minutes. However, the best practice is to call for ads as close to serving as possible to optimize for show rate. Um, in the following slide, I'll talk about better ad experiences, which is very important for publishers who want to improve their revenue. This is the base point that publishers can start to look at. So I'll show you some examples uh, to explain what is a good ad ex experience and what is a bad ad experience. At Facebook, we want to find out what publishers think of some of the top ad formats that we offer. So we conducted a research study and tested seven ad formats with publishers. And here you can see the results of that. So for these ad formats, the higher up that they are in the image shown, the least disruptive they were found to be. And the further to the right means the higher the quality of the ad experience. So what stands out here is rewarded video and native on the top right corner. So these are perceived to be the least disruptive and highest quality ad formats. Um, on the opposite side of the chart, we have interstitials found to be highly disruptive and offering the poorest ad experience. Interstitials, as we know, have a bit of a reputation for being a more intrusive ad format, but we do believe that most of the negative perception of this ad format comes from the misuse of it. So this is an example of a bad ad experience caused by overwhelming amounts of ads during a simple action from the user. So when the user opens up the app, there are two ads that are shown between the app content is even available. This may potentially cause poor user retention over time as well. Um, the main complaint we receive from users is that these ads can be really disruptive and just really annoying in their words. So this is why we recommend that you serve interstitial ads within natural breaks within the app experience. And we also recommend that you keep them at a lower frequency. So you might want to consider using frequency capping to ensure that users are not seeing ads too often in a particular user session. Um, and you also want to remember that you want to capture user attention without annoying and overwhelming them with ads. So as a general rule of thumb, ads should be spaced out so they aren't being shown to a user more than once every 15 minutes or so. You'll also want to consider leveraging segmentation tools to avoid 
showing ads to users during their first session or two. This lets them experience the app without interruption to capture their interests and encourage them to return to the app. And then once you have your user interest and engagement, you can begin to introduce them to ads. So this next example here is having um, ads during a user engagement session, which may cause negative experience to the user who's playing, who's paying attention to the task. So the ads that pop up in this example interrupt the game experience. And showing an ad while users are completing a task or in between steps to complete a task um, or when they are in the middle of a game is really disruptive to that user experience. The expected reaction is for players to dismiss it almost immediately. Um, and oftentimes this uh, type of ad experience can come as a surprise to the user and it can lead to a lot of accidental clicks as well. And so this is a bad user experience that takes them out of the app into a separate landing page unintentionally and offers you know, no value to the advertiser or the publisher. So what we are looking for are intentional clicks. So after task completion and user-based pauses within the app are typically a good fit for interstitial ads. Um, you wanna avoid serving them during the app loading and exit screen as well as because you're just delaying the user from starting or exiting the app. And these user flows typically are not valuable. Um, but here's an example of a good ad experience. In this example, the ad is shown after the task was finished and the user wasn't interrupted. So this is another good example. The ad was shown after the reader finished reading the content. This is a natural break for users going into uh, exploring additional content. So the quality check review implemented by Audience Network is available in Monetization Manager, um, and it will help you navigate where ads in your user flow contribute to positive user experiences that drive value for the advertiser. Um, I highly recommend that you refer to this for guidance when determining where to place ads within your app. And once your team has determined when and how to show an ad, and put the work in to ensure that the ad is loaded and viewed by that user, then we can shift our focus to maximizing the performance of that ad unit. So in this section, we're going to uh, talk about seven strategies to do that. The first step is to create the opportunity to engage user attention, or as we typically say, think like a user. So to make this real, um, let's imagine that you have developed the world's greatest flashlight app and you wanna monetize this with advertising. So where do you put the ad? What I can tell you is where not to put the ad and that's when the flashlight is on. Um, I think if you look back to our previous examples, um, if you're using a flashlight app and you're trying to find keys, um, you're looking under the couch for you know, something that you've dropped or you're trying to read a menu in a dark restaurant, it's really unlikely that the ad, no matter how amazing the ad creative is and no matter how well targeted it is, is going to really get any attention from that user as you know, they're searching in the dark. Um, it really is not an ideal ad placement. So we did a study to better understand ad placements um, and we've identified what we call flow types. So these flow types are references to help define good and bad placements from a user mindset. So in our research, we identified 12 types of user flows. Then we're able to segment these into three tiers based on the quality of the user engagement. The top tier includes four user flows. In feed, which is similar to Facebook, where the user is in a discovery mindset, um, ad discovery, where the user makes an intentional decision to interact with an ad, usually labeled as app of the day or offer of the day. After task um, is as simple as it sounds. It's 
In the flashlight example that we used, this would be showing an ad after the flashlight is turned off and presumably after the user has found their keys. Uh, and then there's the left right swipe. This is similar to uh, feed leveraging experiences where the user is in a discovery mode. Then there are five flows in the middle tier. I'm not going to spend too much time on these since they neither drive engaged user attention nor are really particularly detrimental to the user experience, but the last is detrimental to the user, to the user experience because it tends to either be more disruptive like mid-game or during a task um, in my flashlight example, or simply ignored when you have a static ad while you're scrolling against uh, content, which is often what banner ads do. So now you have decided when to show an ad. Uh, the next step here is to adopt the right ad format. So there are a variety of ad formats that are available with Audience Network, and we offer all of the industry standards, but your team really needs to identify what type works best for your app. So let's look at a few user flows for reward video. After a task, you can give options to the user if they'd like to view a video to receive rewards. Um, this is a natural break and provides options to that user to ensure a good player experience. Another opportunity for rewarded video can be the in-app purchase store. So rewarded video can be provided as an option um, in the store as an alternative when users don't want to pay real money. And the placement helps to retain unpaid users while also monetizing. And then there's the reward video during end game. So publishers can also provide options for the player to watch a rewarded video before proceeding to the next level. Um, End game and between levels are typically natural breaks that the publisher can utilize. So similar to rewarded video, you can also implement interstitial ad formats between a new level or a task. The ad should meet the context and experiences that users are looking for. So with Audience Network, you can leverage the same creative assets across multiple placements and create the experience that your users, um, that you want your users to have. So we let you customize each part of the ad, the font, the height, and with the colors and the position of the assets, including all the required content um, of each ad format, such as the sponsored uh, ad choice icon, the title, the call to action, the media view for the visual element, um, the text, and the logo as well. So by customizing the ad layouts, the ad will be consistent with a theme within the app content, which will provide a less disruptive and um, will drive better engagement. So now that your team has determined when and how to show the ad, you want to make sure that this isn't happening. So this is the endless spinning wheel which we have all seen, and it is not a meaningful user experience. There is no engagement, uh, there's no attention, the only outcome is an annoyed user who is less likely to return to your content. And so you really want to avoid this. And ad caching can help you avoid this. Um, it reduces the latency and provides a improved user experience. Um, this also avoids lost impressions as well. 
So we recommend that you leverage caching on Audience Network. To ensure that your ad is cached, you want to first cache all the elements of the ad, not just the image or the video. Second, you want to request the ad right before showing it. So using people-based targeting will always show the most relevant ad for that specific user. So, and in that particular context as well at that specific moment. So in the spirit, we recommend that you cache for 30 minutes and set a maximum limit of 60 minutes. And finally, we always recommend that caching is done on a first in first out basis as we return ads in order of um, the maximum monetization potential. So once the ad is cached, we'll want to ensure that the user is actually able to see that ad. Consequently, viewability is a major component of monetization. So everyone seems to have their own way of measuring viewability and everyone thinks that their way is the best. Um, it can mean a lot of things, so let's define what it means for Audience Network um, as our advertisers only pay on viewed impressions. So for video, it's measured by video start. And for display, it's measured by 100% of the width and height within view. So making sure that you're using the right user flow, making sure that your ad fits with your app contextually and properly caching and showing the ad will set the foundation for a positive ad experience. Next, I wanna talk about CPM targets. There are three key benefits of CPM targets. It helps you establish <clears throat> one or multiple CPM goals for a single placement ID. It also defines the expected CPM for each placement that's allocated within the waterfall. And it supports server-side geolocation, meaning that if you only need to set up one target per placement and select all the countries you want supported in one place. Um, you can access this tool via monetization manager at the placement level and CPM targets currently supports banner, native, interstitial, rewarded video, and in-stream video. So today, price floors remain among the most popular price tools in the market, but price floors typically deliver the minimum bid that you're willing to accept. This often misses potentially valuable bids that fall right below your price floor. And these missed bids can help maximize revenue and yield. So instead of using price tools that only aim to reach the minimum amount you're willing to accept, CPM Targets is a new pricing tool that's built to help you reach the bid that you actually want. Um, this is developed to help you maximize revenue through consistent CPM performance, CPM targets will aim to deliver the, your desired target by accepting all the, bid, all the bids that are above target and some of the bids below in order to deliver your desired CPM every 24 hours, which ultimately, ultimately will help you maximize revenue for every placement and offers you more control over your performance. And this works best with publishers that are using a waterfall model with two or more demand sources and various price points. It offers the ability to set multiple price points by placement and geography. So CPM targets will help provide several key benefits for the publisher. It'll give you better forecast uh, for your ad revenue. It's the, it'll give you the ability to set price targets that are specific to each placement and country that enables uh, more stable CPM performance and helps you better predict your revenue across your app and your site. So it also allows you to implement country specific targets. Um, you can set up the country, the region and rest of world CPM targets and it's customized to your needs and apply these uh, geographical segments within your app and properties to save you valuable operation time. 
And then finally, it also optimizes your waterfall effectively, right? CPM targets will enable you to access demand from high quality Facebook advertisers at various price points within your waterfall. And it'll allow you to better manage your demand sources and optimize your revenue. So I wanna spend some time talking through how our solution is different to the commonly available price tools. Commonly available options in the market are price floors and price floors represent the lowest amount of money that you're willing to be paid per impression, which has the disadvantage of not accepting bids that are just below the minimum that you've set. So this means that you're potentially missing out on valuable bids. With Audience Network, CPM targets will overcome this disadvantage by taking every bid that's higher than your target, as well as some of the bids that are slightly lower so that it helps you maximize your revenue and yield. And this means if you want an average CPM of 250, you should set your price target to 250. It gives you greater control over your mediation waterfalls by allowing you to set the placement at individual price points rather than just setting a minimum bid amount. So getting started with CPM targets is also fairly simple. Um, first, in uh, price settings, you want to, within monetization manager that is, you'll want to change from um, using automatic optimization to manually set CPM targets. And then from there, you'll apply a global CPM or set CPM targets by country groups. Um, and this will allow you to save a group of countries that share the same CPM target. And then you'll want to test and optimize for based on your results. So please visit our best practices guides in the Help Center to learn more uh, tips and tricks and best, practice for, best practices for taking full advantage of uh, our CPM targets. So here are some key tips to help you utilize CPM targets uh, a little bit more effectively. You'll want to use no more than three placements with targets per ad space, and you'll only use CPM targets for placements with at least 10,000 impressions per day. So you want to avoid setting CPM targets too close in value to one another when using multiple CPM targets per ad space, as this can lead to low fill rate as well. And then finally, be patient. CPM targets can take up to 48 hours to take effect, but if you run it for at least seven days, it'll give you a more accurate calibration. Um, and then test and optimize based on those results, right? Making incremental changes to your CPM targets can help you maximize yield over time. The higher your CPM targets are, the lower your fill rate will be. So you wanna keep that in mind as well. Um, ultimately, CPM targets will provide the unique ability to position audience that work at various points throughout your waterfall. And this helps you to take full advantage of our high quality demand pool of global advertisers. So we call this approach the sandwich model right here. And here is a quick overview of how you're going uh, to go about optimizing using the sandwich model. First, you'll want to place audience that work at the top of your waterfall. This will let you take full advantage of the bid spread within Facebook and our pool of high quality advertisers. Second, you'll want to add a second audience that work placement and put us 10 to 20% lower than the above demand source in order to capture more of Facebook's demand. Third, you want to track performance for each ad position by using a unique naming convention for each of those ad spaces. And then lastly is you want to experiment with country groups and um, the sandwich model in order to maximize that revenue. So before we move on to the next topic, um, I know we've covered a lot so far, so please take a moment to recap on these strategies. The first, create opportunities for engaged user attention. So Know, um, know the ad flow types and properly implement when to show them in your app journey. Um, 
you want to adopt the right ad format. You want to always choose the format carefully to ensure that user experience um, is positive and that it's driving conversions. Customize for context and experience as well. So customize according to the policy guidelines as well. Keep that in mind. Um, the fourth is leveraging ad caching to reduce latency. The fifth is to ensure the user sees the ad. So be considerate with your UX and UI design to ensure that ads are easily visible to the user and then maximize your revenue with CPM targets. So there you have it. Six simple things for your team to do to optimize your revenue as a publisher. Of course, it's not always that simple uh, to find that optimal solution across all these tactics. So we do recommend that your team adopts the same approach that we use throughout Facebook, uh, using a test and learn approach for optimization. So what exactly is A-B testing? At the highest level, The experiments are designed to test a hypothesis um, focused on single changes to provide a clean comparison between a test and control group. Um, it involves the use of randomized samples to minimize the bias within the test and control group and leveraging the tests of statistical significance to ensure that you're making the decision based off of real signals. So in this case, you'll see a comparison between implementing large buttons and small buttons and test within two countries with different CPMs. So this is to minimize bias because one country may have different preferences on button designs. And this is only an example of what you can do. There are many more things that you can implement A-B testing for. So what should your team test? In a word, uh, everything. <laughs> this includes all the things that we've discussed today, including the location of the ads. Uh, the prominence is important, but so is user experience. The button sizes is also important. We found that making a CTA more prominent in the design leads to greater interactions. Uh, testing different colors. Green in particular seems to perform well, but the winner may ultimately be the color that best aligns with your app design, um, as well as testing cover images. Although cover images are optional, we have seen engagement grow when there is a prominent part of the ad. Uh, you'll also want to test bigger screen elements. Uh, people are usually drawn to larger elements on a mobile screen. Testing frequency, are you serving too many ads, too few ads? Uh, testing the caching, when and how ads are requested and loaded, as well as video and video settings. If you're using video, is it optimized for your market? Um, and finally, price targets and bidding. If you're auction if you're using um, bidding, is your auction strategy optimized? And these are ultimately just a few um, tests that you can run with your, uh, with your overall app. So I hope that you found all of this really helpful. Now would be a great time to ask any questions that you might have that's directly uh, relevant to the presentation and you can ask that directly in the question comment box. Uh, please do keep in mind that I'm only going to be able to answer any questions that's relevant to this presentation. So if you do have anything that's not directly related to optimization, please do continue to use our resources like the Help Center support channel and Monetization Manager and our publisher support team should be able to help you answer those. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take those now. Thanks everyone again for sitting through um, that presentation. I do have a few questions coming in and I will be taking those right now. Um, I also had a couple of people mention that they were unable to hear uh, the, the presentation. So if you have um, had any trouble 
um, with the first half of the presentation or if it was cutting out or anything, we will be sending out a recording of the presentation um, and the Q&A session as well. So the entire webinar uh, session following the, uh, the session today. So look out for that in your email so that you can catch all of it. Uh, the first question that we received was from an early bird that came just before the start of the webinar. And the question is uh, in two parts. The first is uh, how can we increase our CPM? And the second is how can we pass the quality checks? So I hope that the webinar was able to answer uh, your CPM questions, but to quickly recap, CPM can typically fluctuate uh, due to a number of factors. And this includes seasonality, supply and demand, um, user demographic changes, et cetera, right? So to improve on your CPM, um, you know, you want to take a look at some of these factors, uh, starting with, you know, reviewing your ad requests. So we're only able to respond to ads when we're given an opportunity to, right? So um, the more ad requests that you send, the more opportunity on an audience network has to respond and fill the requests and to serve more impressions to you. Um, you also want to look at factors like uh, CTR, fill rate, show rate, to ensure that all of these metrics are healthy. Um, and then as always, you wanna take a look at the, uh, the ads within your app as well, right? At the implementation of it, picking the right formats that fit your user journey, um, and then acquiring and retaining quality users uh, for your application as well as creating, you know, uh, a smooth and good user experience that really drives conversion. And ultimately, um, for more control of your CPM, you can always implement CPM targets as well. And then for the second part of that question um, on passing the quality check, quality is, you know, one of the building foundation blocks to ensuring that your audience network um, performance is performing optimally, right? So it is um, a topic in and of itself. Um, and we do have webinars that cover quality so that uh, we can cover it in an entirety. Um, so please do stay tuned for that, but also feel free to reach out to the publisher support team um, via monetization manager, you can reach out to the help center there uh, in the interim if you have any specific questions about your application. Another question um, from David is, what is the maximum number of CPM targets and ad spaces that I can have for a given app? Uh, that is a great question. I don't recall if that was covered, but um, the maximum number of CPM targets that you can have uh, currently is three. And the reason for this maximum is that once you start having more than three targets per placement within ad space, it can actually start to cannibalize its own performance, right? So um, our recommendation here is if you need to have more than three targets per ad space, take a step back first and understand how that performance may be harming your overall waterfall and if it really is necessary. Um, and if it is, you can create an additional ad space. Um, that is the current workaround for this right now. Um, we're always identifying you know, outliers and reasons where publishers might need more than three, but for the majority of our publishers, three has been typically sufficient. And then a question from uh, Benti. Why is the recommended difference in the sandwich model 10 to 20% of the price above it? That's a really great question. So we typically recommend 10 to 20% um, just based off of you know, historical performance. Um, in the studies, we have found that the spread has um, been the most successful. And we, we always recommend that you test with incremental changes um, so that it doesn't um, so you don't see a huge, you know, uh, rise or drop within your performance, but you can you can see the gradual changes, right? And recommend the recommendation of ten to twenty percent is so that the the two uh, settings are not too close together, that it cannibalizes the performance of each other. That's a great question. 
Um, another question from David is, when will the rewarded video ads be available for non-gaming apps? That is an uh, equally important question. Right now, rewarded video is available available for gaming apps, um, but we are actually starting to open up the beta program to um, other verticals as well. Currently, it's being opened up to uh, the dating and social vertical as well as news verticals. I don't have, you know, a timeline for any additional verticals, but, you know, as the product team slowly starts to onboard other verticals and we see the success and we, uh, we can ensure that the rewarded video placements are being used as they should be um, once it goes um, into, you know, additional verticals or once it goes into, uh, full access for the general public, you'll be able to see that access within Monetization Manager. All right, let's take a look at some of these other questions. A question from uh, Narek, can you talk about GDPR? Why should a consent be shown to users? Uh, when should a consent be shown to users and when not? So this is a really great, great, a really great question. Um, I can't speak very much on it and I would really recommend that you write into the help center um, in monetization manager uh, to, to get a little bit more clarity on this. And then there are also help center documentations within um, our audience network help center that shed some light on this as well, but that's a great question. Uh, Jesse asked if you'll be getting the deck along with the recording and yes, you'll be able to see the visual and audio. Simon asked, where do you find the previous webinars? Uh, Simon, great question. Currently, we don't actually have a, a library of the previous webinars, um, but for future reference, um, when we send out webinars, um, please feel free to register even if you can't attend because once you've registered, we'll be able to send you the recording after the webinar. Um, and we are currently, our marketing team is working on you know, ensuring that there is a library so that it can be available um, to all of you post-webinar as well. Great question. Uh, Alejandro asked, how does the conversion algorithm work? How is it able to find people to convert? What trades it look? Uh, what trade does it look at in the population? Um, this is an interesting question, and uh, please let me know if I'm not quite answering it correctly. Um, but ultimately, when you are looking at the best way to optimize your performance with an audience network, and you want to optimize for conversions, you want to take a look at the uh, the way your app is designed, right? And the ad flows within your app to ensure that it's got, um, that the ads within your app make sense for where it is implemented and that the format of it makes sense, right? Um, and then audience network, of course, um, is able to target the, the ad content to the specific users uh, that are engaged with your app. But ultimately, if the best way for you to ensure um, optimal conversions is to take a look, think like the user, uh, take a look at the user journey, um, take a look at where there are natural pauses within the app experience where the user might be receptive to ads and be more um, engaged with it at that moment um, where it can encourage that conversion, right? I hope that answers that question. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I have another question, um, Alejandro, again, um, but I'm not quite sure I understand, Alejandro, if you can clarify. It, your question is, does having two ad sets with the same audience uh, copy the same ad set, does it compete against itself? So uh, if this is referring to, you know, A-B testing, typically uh, when you are testing two different creatives with the same set of audience, um, it you wouldn't be able to test it at the same time necessarily. Maybe you'll you'll do one set first and then the second set after. Um, but if you're trying to to test two um, different ad sets at the same time, then you would typically test it with two different but comparable audiences. I hope that answers that question as well. And then we are, we're starting to run out of time here. Um, we're going just a little bit past the, uh, the scheduled webinar time. Um, I do have additional questions coming through. So if we don't have a chance to answer your question, please do feel free to write into the Help Center um, within Monetization Manager. I know I've mentioned this a couple of times already, but they are, they're there to help you. Um, and they will, they'll be able to um, either, you know, help you troubleshoot directly uh, with the issues that you're experiencing with your app or provide recommendations, or they can also uh, point you in the right direction for help center documentation that can provide you uh, more of like a general uh, best practices guideline as well. So I'm going to take one more question before we leave here. Um, a lot of thank yous. You're very welcome. I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, A question from Narek, can the following be considered a rule of thumb for showing interstitial ads when a current screen within an app is changing? So this is a really great question. Um, and this is a little bit broad when you are, when you're mentioning a, a change in the screen. Um, typically, it's the way I like to think about it is not when the screen is changing, but when the user is pausing between actions, right? Because um, a lot of the times, you know, uh, in a gaming app, for example, the screen can change um, from one action to the next. Um, but if the user is still engaged with the gameplay experience, if they're still clicking around in, you know, in the app, it can trigger accidental clicks or unintentional interactions with an ad. Um, and that doesn't drive uh, quality conversions, right? And so rather than thinking of when the screen is changing um, and focusing more on you know what that user is doing when they're within your app. You can uh, you can kind of pinpoint when a user is engaged with the app, and when they are um, in discovery mode or pausing between levels, for example, right? Um, and that would be kind of the best way to try to approach when to to use interstitial ads. But really great question. Thank you for that. Um, and since I said that was my last question, I want to just say thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar today. Um, I hope that you found it informative. Um, we uh, really appreciate it and we'll actually be sending out a short survey um, following this webinar just to get some of your feedback on it and see if there might be ways that we can improve on any future sessions that we hold as well. So please do take a quick minute to complete that survey. Your feedback is really, really appreciated and um, we do take it very seriously. So thank you again, everyone for joining um, and I hope you have a great rest of your week.